Welcome. This is the February 15th Beehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Rod, Jan, Dan, Antrenig, and myself, Michael. And the, I guess it's review stage or not, we have a slurp back end with a port, a lib slurp. Uh, Jan, can you tell us about what that promises to do? Here is the review. So if I understand the intent correctly, this is about basically uh, port forwarding. Um, so what happens is that some process on the host binds sockets and incoming connections are then uh, translated into Ethernet frames uh, injected into a guest's virtual NIC so that it looks like, for example, your guest has an additional network interface with, uh, and you can just SSH to a port on the host network stack and it, in reality, it connects to the guest network stack. Ooh. Uh, so that you don't really have to do anything to expose ports. Um, yeah. So as far as I understand it, it is only for incoming uh, flows because right now, especially with Capsicum, as long as it is implemented in process, you can't really um, establish new outbound connections, even if uh, Lipslurp or however that's pronounced uh, supports this. In theory, uh, the Capsicum security model does not. Uh, so it would either have to use an external um, helper like Casper D, or it would have to uh, fork um, sandboxing itself, fork off a child to act as proxy for it. And basically write its own special purpose proxy running libslab there. But from a glance of the code, I think it does not implement this uh, right now because, yeah, that's not needed. The interesting design challenge this brings up is that for licensing reasons and so on, uh, libslurp is not going to go into the FreeBSD tree. Instead, it will live as a port, the library. So now uh, basically this requires to come up with a yeah, shared library interface for network backends. Do you know what else uses libslurp to date? Uh, QEMO can use it. All right. Okay. Um, Kubernetes sometimes does that. Uh, Why would I want to use this over, over NetGraph? Um, because this is easier to uh, set up. Oh my God. And because it is less invasive. So basically, this could be useful if you are not alone on the system and you're not supposed to completely mess around with the network configuration. So it would be useful for a workstation kind setup where you want to be a Beehive user and not a kernel developer. But yeah, there is little you can do with that, which, or no, there's nothing you can do with this, which couldn't be done with an additional NIC and proper host configuration already. It's about making it less invasive so that you can just start Beehive and it works and you don't have to solve any problems with the host configuration and agree on how to set up this dedicated host or even worse, agree how to set, uh, set up this shared host. So yeah. And what was that about performance? It sounds kind of limited. So, what? This backend has poor performance, but it does not require any network configuration yeah. on the host. Hmm. Okay. It's mostly so that you can have easy access to things like an SSH server. Fair enough. Anything uh, else relating to, to that? Tests, for example. So if you need a SSH connection to test that your guest is working or to provision something, then this can be useful. Well, there it is. Anything else relating to that? So the most interesting thing I think about this is that 
it brings us closer to making things hot pluggable basically, or at least runtime loadable because this library exists as a port or package. So it's not a base. So it has to be loaded via DL open during Beehive startup. And for that, it needs an API to do that. And this is the same thing which is needed for the NFS block devices, but therefore a block backend, not a network backend. Hmm. And maybe this gets us there. So why solve two special cases when you can solve maybe the generic case? Alrighty. Well, I have a quick one. I struggled with a Windows 10 VM that was simply imaged from a hardware disk. In general, this has worked well for me, but it would just choke when it wanted to choke at about 108 percent CPU. I threw lots of memory and vCPUs at it, but it would just consistently hang. I got through updates under Windows, but if anyone's seen just a, cons a consistent issue like that, I'm all ears. What what process is consuming the 108%? Uh, the VM is frozen such that I don't get to see that. But oh, that's okay. the $64,000 question. Um. I can hit it with oh, a hundred eight percent load on the host. Yeah, on the host, correct. And, and the the Windows itself is completely non-responsive. Yep. Okay. So just I will watch this space, but um, it was disappointing. So I would love to be offered some VMware deployments just to smoke test convert to say beehive and zen because i know you might need zen for say bios booted vms uh what do you do does the, the the group and world think that we need some documentation on how to migrate from vmware to other destinations especially those uh, we discuss on this call the time is right and for what it's worth have you seen any exemplary documentation on other systems of hey who's what reading the news headlines what i don't want to do is set I, up i don't a, know mr patterman do we do we really need to tell people how to migrate to away from vmware maybe not to migrate off VMware, but where they might migrate to. I do not see Beehive as a viable alternative to VMware for most people. Fair enough. This, I mean, technically for me, it's, it works fine, but I do not think for a home lab person that is used to the ESXi vSphere environment that Beehive has the tooling. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I think the biggest, wait. sorry. Go ahead. I said, I think the biggest thing missing though is that ease of use tooling around it. Yeah, yeah. That's an easy to use. That, well, like I said, for me, technologically, Beehive works absolutely fine for migrating off ESXi. I did that. Two or three years ago, um, I've actually migrated off of ESXi and back to ESXi, and now I'm migrating to Proxmox. And the technologically underlying hypervisors all do just fine, but it's the tooling. We desperately need something that's Proxmox like on top of VMware or on top of Beehive. Yep. I mean, there's there's VM Beehive, which gives you a little bit better command line tooling. Yep, and the list has been building what the MVP might be. And if I scroll down a few inches, it's the start, stop, create, resource analytics. So 
Uh, well, thank you, Enterprise Working Group, for pushing this. Does anyone know if the RunHive project ever got off the ground? Oh, there you go. Uh, let's see, runhive.app. Let me make a copy of that. Uh, good. Let's take a look. Uh, run hive. I see a teaser, not much else. Hmm. Exactly. That's all I remember that someone started I started working on this and then nothing. Plus I don't see a web GUI there, just console. And if we look at our little I, I'm hubby giddy over here. If you scroll, scroll clear to the bottom, there's a link to a GitHub. Yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Let's oh, see, okay. run hive yeah, activities. <laughs> uh, VMB hive, wait, what? Um, web app, oh, well, Elixir, wait. Entrenig, take a drink if you can. Uh, BSD2 clause, okay. I like what I see, but we're talking two years ago. We're talking so it's dead. six years ago. It died. Er, Ah, uh, yeah, well, I would be curious how far along they got. There they have a bunch of buzzwords I'm comfortable with. So there's that. Uh, chef hypervisor. Okay. Wait, what? Interesting. Well, that uh, might be worth a few minutes of investigating. Entreneg, Elixir, heard that? Uh, no repo movement in two years. Ah, uh, well, uh, yeah. All right. So when exactly did Lenovo keyboards go to hell? <laughs> X240. Okay. Uh, yeah, X, depending on who you asked, X230 or X240. <sighs> when they stopped being IBM. Uh, well, IBM's pretty early, we... but just the latest ones, the track. I'll shut up. They really weren't the uh, trackpad with a 240 and the like because they removed the physical buttons for the uh, clip mouse. Hmm. They do have the three across the top, which I'm fine with, and the nub, but just the trackpad just goes, you let go of a click and it just goes somewhere, just, you know. At Usually least south. <laughs> to 40, you couldn't disable the trackpad completely because the so-called buttons for the uh, little knob are just uh, click zones on the trackpad. Oh, boy. Yep. I, you, you crank the sensitivity down enough, the trackpad pretty much becomes turned off. Hmm. Okay, other topics yes, or short and sweet? Dan, do you have any topics? Uh, Antonig's happy to see that it uses no. the last project uses Octo. That was a no. Welcome, Chris. I bet you have an update for your project because we we're about to wrap up. There he is. What you got? Let's see. <laughs> How's your audio feeling today? I hope it's better. Oh, lovely. Okay. Yes. Lovely. Uh, All right. Okay. <laughs> Nice. I've got some update. Please. If I can jump in. Yeah, please do. I, um, we just shot through some topics you can see on screen and yes. uh, let her rip. I, um, for those of you who have not coincidentally noticed because you were subscribed to Fabricator, I started a review to finally get started on the uh, on improving the handbook. Um, oh, wow. Yes. So um, I kind of started this out of a conversation with Greg and Greg kind of pointed me in the direction and I got a couple pointers I read up on the, on the um, documentation handbook and I finally started last uh, 
Yes, I will put the link in. Thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, that's the usual suspect. I will uh, I will look that up and I'll post it in the doc. Um, and I just need to check my notes because I'm fairly confident I've got a couple of questions that I would like to run by the by everyone here, basically. And um, I will I will I will jump in when I find my notes, basically. Uh, so just give me a minute. And Jan, you posted a GitHub repo for Christian Mortz, but it is denied, access denied. What's the context on that one, Jan? Wait, that isn't public yet? I just did, tried to Chris, it. did you get, give me any privileges on your stuff before uh, you notice? Not that I, it not opened that I fine for me. Really? Maybe the... Maybe Copy you don't cute. have a GitHub account at all, Mr. Dexter? Dude, I've got input? like eight repos. Oh, I see. You throw the question mark in there. Maybe that choked it. Let's see. Oh, yeah. You may have. Well, Zoom chat is Zoom chat, and it did its thing. So let's see. Oh, there we go. There we go. That's the VM state D. February 10th. Okay. And here's your review. Da, 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 da. I'm not do this. There we go. Okay. Oh, you put it in there. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll put it in context. Uh, so, what kind of questions do you have? Well, I'll bring that up in just a sec. The moment it's happy. Uh, yeah. Where did chat go? Okay. All right. So my questions. Um, basically, there's one particular question that I have for the review because I put something in that actually I think it was Jan who raised that. Um, that um, if you have CFS in a host and a guest, then you have memory pressure because of the cache. And I put something in that hopefully is the right way to do it. I was a little bit uncertain, so I would like to get your take on this because basically I suggested, if you scroll down somewhere, I think you can see it, to, um, yes, exactly, to set primary cache metadata for, um, Oh, everything but Windows. Okay, that is good to know because I have not put if that in. If I remember in, correctly, right. Windows, if it detects that it's virtualized, will ah, right. stop all but the most uh, limited disk caching and instead expect the hypervisor to do the caching. Right, okay. But okay. ask someone running Windows virtualized regularly you now. And you, you do that? Do you do you put those settings in the guest or do you put those for the host? Because now I, uh, I suggest the, to put the it in the guest. The primary cache equals uh, metadata is for the host. I prefer what to host? the okay. guest, right. guest do a VIO caching because it knows more right. about the patterns than you Thank can you. infer or on the host especially when you run ZFS on ZFS because the guest ZFS uh, still, for example, can do file-based prefetching instead of just block-based prefetching. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then um, the I was thing, wondering... Yeah, sorry, please. Go ahead. The next thing uh, I normally do uh, on a dedicated virtual machine host is to limit the host's arc. Uh, so that I will not eventually, as I uh, put more guests on it, run in a situation where I ping pong against the uh, arc size. Mm -hmm. And... Um... Couple points that I also wrote down for um, 
Well, Windows host is basically NVMe is the recommended storage, I suppose, or the recommended storage backend. And what I was also wondering if you guys have any kind of recommended because I've got I've got one for Windows 10 that I know that works, but if you have anything for Windows 11, a command line sample, I would very much appreciate it because in particular uh, respect to uh, TPM pass through. Um, because I think that would also be totally worthwhile to put in eventually, maybe not in the particular review right now that I'm working on, but um, at a later stage, which also brought me to another question. Um, and I'm now probably going down a rabbit hole with that question, but um, I figure I should still ask it. And actually I'm not probably not the first one to ask because I think Michael, didn't you raise that question also previously about um, developing some um, software TPM emulation or something for Beehive, whether that isn't something that we should pursue. Oh, absolutely. So Goran from the calls did port the permissively licensed payload from IBM to FreeBSD ports, and it is on Corvin's to-do list to address that, but I checked with him just about a week or two ago, and he said he's distracted from that, but uh, the emulation okay. would be uh, I, in my book, pretty significant insofar as certain vendors are trying to obsolete, dare I say, millions of pieces of hardware that do not include TPM or an older version of a TPM. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one I, that I consider very important. Uh, one quick thing beyond the TPM, I did a recent smoke test on 2000, Windows Server 2016, 19, 22, and 25 preview, which hint is only just a Windows 11 desktop on a server. Um, I used virtually identical auto on a 10.xml syntax by just changing the version number and it worked great on all of them. There are tricks that are in the wiki on at one point disabling the TPM requirement and putting it in a bit of a lab mode that I think Jason Tubner kindly put on the wiki. So do look at the Windows related wiki entries. And I do have some aging Windows related Google Docs. So I'm very glad you're attending to that. Uh, and yeah, I, I deal with that now daily. <laughs> so yeah, let's uh, let's connect relating to that. I don't know if you have a chat platform of choice, but feel free to reach out to me on be it. You name it, you name it. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, the earlier Windows 2025 preview did not boot for whatever reason. They seem to have changed their licensing or not quite finalized it such that leaving out a product key didn't boot, but adding one in just one of those public broad, uh, what do they even call them? OEM ones or something or bulk licensing ones worked. And so... I can spin it up in in minutes. <laughs> so yeah, uh, other points in your review. And I didn't see NVMe mentioned, but that's not in here. Yeah, I, I, yet. okay, cool. that's not in yet. That's I mean, I, I as I as I stated at the beginning of the of the review, basically, I wanted to start small just to make sure that I'm on the right track. And, I think the, the feedback that I've got so far is really good because it gives me a couple of pointers that um, I should do in the future, like um, like a no-brainer, you know, use Grammarly to check my writing. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I could have thought about that, but I didn't. Um, so I will do that in the future. And um, and um, also a couple of syntax things that I didn't really properly check. And once I have that, and once we have that um, merge, then I will basically go for the next iteration. I will, I will, you know, keep going for increments because I think the larger the review, the higher the chances that this is not going to get merged at the end, I'm afraid. Well, docs and code can be very different things. This is very valuable and you're, you've come to the right place. And yes, I'd go with the Oxford comma. It took years for mm -hmm. people to convince me, but I'm finally <laughs> grumbling. I, just as an input point, how much time do I have to complete a review? Good question. Um, I, I really don't know. Any, I mean, feedback is totally welcome. So, um, and yeah, how soon do you plan on on pushing this in? 
Um, there is no date yet at the moment, to be honest. Um, I need to talk to, my, my plan was to talk to Joe about it because um, basically I mean, the first thing I wanted to do is basically clean up what, uh, what the um, feedback is pointing out and bring that, uh, bring those changes back into the review. And once those are in, then I guess it's going to be a next cycle of iteration for, 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 for a second review. And then hopefully with, uh, with a couple more steps, uh, we'll get there. And again, um, I think this is going to be work in progress no matter what, because um, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, the way I, I look at it, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I regard the handbook as some, some living document, you know, a living entity. And I think it, 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 uh, it kind of it kind of lives also from, from continuously updating it. And that's basically also why I have one kind of generic question to all of you guys, but is the, the kind of um, topics do you feel are missing? Uh, just one idea. Now with FreeBSD 12 end of life, uh, life uh, should the handbook on Beehive be updated to only document the uh, configuration syntax instead of the flag-based syntax? That is something I totally also want to add in, yes. yes. Um, because I was thinking I need to add something how to uh, convert from the flags to have the config file because it's also not really in there yet um, by using the dump feature, basically. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, just use the dump feature, uh, remove the dump flag from exactly. the output, yeah. and yeah. Beehive will do it for you. I definitely want to put that in in the next iteration. Yes. True, but working your way back to flags is a challenge, so I, I, I don't consider Why? it completely gone because it may well split a certain single string into several which opinions can vary all they want so don't worry about that it's your call but what i think it's can we think of any both, you know, you know, yeah. can we think of any 14 changes that beyond like what vcpu count i don't forget if that made it into 13 too but i don't think we have anything super significant distinguishing 13 and 14 but I'm happy to be wrong on that. And Chris, your audio declines over time, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm going to jump back in. Mr. Tuffley, welcome. Do you have any topics to it? No, I don't want to last. No. Nope. Any topics to address? Nothing today. And you were diving into some rather interesting topics uh any updates any anything uh no unfortunately uh i i, I the 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 project that i was kind of trying to get going uh ends up it won't materialize so Aww. i know but <laughs> but fun stuff along the way and i'll uh i'll i'll Kind of clean up some odds and ends that I found and get get all that pushed in, but uh, yeah. We recently discussed your updated, friendlier, nicer, cooler Grub to Beehive. Any movement on that? Because uh, Chris here is working on the handbook page, better late than never, and he does mention Grub to Beehive. Uh, so, Grub. Now, nothing, nothing to update. Um, I've tried to rebase my changes on the latest Grub stuff, and uh, and things are are broken. I'm running into uh, GNU lib problems, and trying to debating whether I sort through those or do something uh, much simpler. The uh, the the grub grub does a whole lot more than we actually need it to do. I mean, the original grub to beehive thing was really how do I get the grub code to act like beehive load? And I'm wondering if there isn't a simpler approach to kind of unifying the two. Um, but uh, I, I haven't thought that all the way through yet. Um, what I can't help but asking is, wouldn't it be easier to have a read-only uh, 
grub block device running on top of a UEFI boot room rather than porting it to run in some kind of Frankenstein state like uh, beehive load. Um, isn't there an EFI port of grub? You can run a grub too on a uh, UEFI system, at least on physical hardware. Uh, yeah, there's um, some of the images that I ran into did not work great with the UEFI CSM. Um, I didn't uh, investigate the integration of UEFI with Grub. I These, wanted there, this is a version of Grub that runs purely in UEFI. It does not use the CSM at all. Exactly. I'm not aware of that one. Okay, it's called grub grub.efi. Okay. And then as long as we don't uh, lose any boot worm, you could kind of use this to boot from inside Beehive without a, a two-stage bootloader. Does uh, does that grub UE does that grub EFI, but that grub EFI only works with UEFI images, correct? Correct. Yeah. Well, with but, anything now? Yes and no. It works with anything no. which boots with grub. <laughs> I believe I believe it can even even read a non-GPT disk still. Yes, it can. So what's more important is that your grub configuration works with this grub, which is the same problem you already had with grub beehive and the external mapping file from grub device name to guest devices. Which was okay. always a pain. Well, that might that might be something to uh, go investigate for me. It, it may it, it's probably grub two dot efi. And for these things, uh, oftentimes the uh, Arch Linux wiki is worth a check. True. <laughs> okay. Good. Good suggestions. Thank you. Chuck, do they have releases yet? There was a point there where right after Peter ported Grub to Beehive, it was years between any tangible release per se, as opposed to snapshot of the week. Um, I think the last thing I saw on Peter's work was um, John updated it to match the new uh, libvmm API change. Okay. But does Grub have releases per se? Grub has releases. Okay. Uh, Peter's stuff, there's zero chance that that would get upstreamed. Understood. But how about getting a port for UEFI Grub, just, which just basically contains the disk image you would expose as read only block device to the guest? Yeah, like I said, I, I don't know if that would work with a particular image that I I'm was working with. Um, and that would that's something I would need to investigate. And if that works, then yeah, that would be a great path forward. I think you would have you would have to use a second hard disk. You'd have to you, you your VM, if it existed today, with one hard drive, is the way to use Grub to EFI would be to create a separate hard drive that just had an EFI partition on it and had Grub EFI installed in that. And then, and then set the boot order. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then no, no, no. I get, yeah. I, no, I get, I, I get that. It would just okay. kind of be a matter of if that worked with the, uh, the, the image that was causing me problems. Yeah. And it sounds like it very well made. No problem. Yeah, it, is, it is Linux code. But at least my hope would be that you can get it to boot without having to uh, add a EFI partition to the existing guest disks. And where are you going to modify load that? Rob to EFI from? Yeah. So it has to load from somewhere. I, I, are you going to do a beehive load it into? The... No. My first idea would be to add 
basically on a lower PCI ID than the default one uh, disk, uh, tiny a few megabyte read only disk oh, okay. holding only the oh, okay. EFI partition table and then a file system dedicated to read only GWAP, which only tells it to search for another disk to chain load further from. I, I still think there is, so I, I will definitely go down that path. That's That seems like a, a very good avenue of investigation. One thing that I am a little bit curious about is if you look at, at other hypervisors, they also include the ability to boot straight from a kernel image and, and kind of bypass the entire BIOS UEFI emulation. And I, I can't help- hypervisor does that? Cross VM. Huh? Cross VM. Uh, one way to get there uh, without modifying Beehive would be to uh, um, just set up a Linux guest with KXX support so that you could uh, use Linux KXX to exec into a different kernel from your uh, little UEFI installation. So you, you use the smallest distribution you you can uh, find for this with a modern kernel and boot it up, mount the other file system, exec into a different kernel and keep on running. Yes, that, that sounds interesting, but but my curiosity was more around the why that is being done. And uh, I'm wondering if you can't get to faster boot times by bypassing all of the, the BIOS and UEFI stuff, most of which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for VMs. Correct. The important part why I would like to keep it is that it precludes you from ever doing a migration to I'm physical a, hardware. A, and yeah, the yeah. other problem is that uh, it's tied to a specific kernel. So yeah, or at least let's say ABI between no, I think it, it, and kernel. I think Chuck might be on the track or something here. What we could do is is use Linux has the ability to link their kernel as a direct EFI binary. And it might be useful to try and make a beehive load or actually, uh, no, I couldn't do that. Um, I think I think there is something that that is analogous or rhymes like beehive load and 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 that grub to beehive stuff. Yeah, you need the. I'm just trying to think. The problem is, is all of these. Let's see. Does. I mean, you can do it. You can link a kernel in a way that you don't need any BIOS or, or EFI support or anything. And it might make sense to try and make a way. Well, I, Beehive itself already has the ability. You can you can load and create a memory image and then just hand it to Beehive until it start executing. Yep. So this is purely a matter of resolving the linking magic to create a suitable binary load yep exactly and and, and, and then the curiosity would be I mean, is that I can't, any faster i can't i mean how much time do we spend in the ed edk2 uaf bios how long does it take to execute that stuff i just it seems like to me in, in beehive it's a trivial amount of time it's not on real hardware efi takes a long time, as does a BIOS, because it has to do all this probing of fairly slowly responding hardware. But in a virtualized environment, that stuff is all really fast. Yep. Yeah, agreed. And 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 the the way I'm trying to frame this is it's it's a curiosity. It's a, an area that I'm 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 interested in poking at, and it very well may may make absolutely no difference. Question, could the FreeBSD kernel be built as an EFI loadable binary? I believe the original Beehive was done, well, it wasn't built as an EFI binary, but the original Beehive load, I mean, that's exactly what it did. It loaded the FreeBSD kernel 
directly in the memory region and just started it. In I think it even started in in long mode. Hmm. So uh, the FreeBSD kernel can basically, if you don't want to lo load kernel modules on a BIOS system, you used to be able to directly bypass all the boot stages um, so that you could go from BIOS to kernel directly. It's normally not a good idea. Uh, and on embedded systems, for example, the uh, Octeon 1 boards where FreeBSD MIPS 64 used to run, uh, you could directly just load the kernel into memory and go uh, with U-boot. Uh, but again, that's an embedded system. Yeah. But in theory, the kernel can do it. The question is why would you want to um, tie yourself that closely to a specific hypervisor configuration instead of just working with what's universally supported on real hardware and therefore a more flexible interface? So what do you gain for all of that uh, locked in to a specific setup? Because I sure would hate to be restricted to a specific kernel version of anything by the hypervisor. So the kernel you want or the kernel configuration you want isn't available in the boot menu, you're out of luck. Is that something uh, we want to uh, end up in? What do we get for that? That could be worth this. Chuck, you had a question in the chat. Is that what you meant, that uh, non-UEFI VM images? I'm pretty sure they're all hybrid and can boot as both BIOS and... Uh, no, no, they're SMR. they're they're actually not. Oh, so not. the, oh, maybe the, the cool. images that I was trying to um, basically there was an effort to move from an existing hypervisor uh, virtualization environment to Beehive, hmm. and there was a catalog of existing images that did not have UEFI. Uh, it was deemed impossible to convert them to UEFI. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> and and so uh, the so my interest was in how do I get those booting with with Beehive. Hmm. So so that was that was the motivation. Got it. Got it. And yes, and note my comment from the last call that CBIOS never got beyond uh, just an idea, although it's in Zen. So there is a port and there it is, and that at least paves the way for such a thing. Uh, welcome, Daniel. What you got? And Chris, we can definitely circle back to your handbook page and VMstd. Um, <laughs> you simply reconnected Nothing much on my side. I'm wondering which which specific distributions are are causing heartache with the uh, UEFI C, uh, CSM and and Grub related issues. Um, I have definitely struggled before, but I haven't met any that I couldn't get booted. Uh, yeah, Chuck. Do you have any? These are um, based on uh, they're they're it's basically they're 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 highly customized Linux images. Um, Legacy, I think, is the word you're hunting for. No, I wish it was just legacy. Well, yeah, there's there there's a there's a there's a healthy dollop of basically. I think the the magic on how to create them has been lost. Um, so they, they are what they are and they need to boot and, and no one wants to change anything with them. Yeah, I think I've, I've definitely had problems with scent, scent related ones that put grub in bizarre places like appliances. I think free PBX did some insane stuff, but you could, 
I could sort of dig around and find the config or modify it and I could get it going, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Yeah, these these were dynamic enough that they they do tend to upgrade the Linux kernel version. So in my mind, the existing Grub to Beehive was was not a good option. Um, and uh, the uh, the the CSM support uh, worked with some of them, but not all of them. And I'll throw in the narrative that if a vendor gives you a VM image and you modify it in any way, your license and support might go out the window, even though it's a trivial change, such as from QCOW2 to RAW or something. So there's that. There are there are reasons. Don't tell them. There's that. <laughs> oh, was I unmuted? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you just thought that too, just not. Um, Jan, did you have something about optimizing UEFI boot performance in chat? No, um, I found that when I set up operating systems um, and boot guests, that so little time is spent before the guest bootloader or kernel runs that I wonder how much there is worth optimizing other than the complexity of having UEFI support at all, which we can't get rid of. So um is it really worth spending a lot of time and effort on chasing quickly can... diminishing returns i believe independently of whether you're trying to load some linux or other image or not it is valuable being able to directly link c code into an executable module that can be run by Beehive directly without any BIOS involvement or anything. Oh yes, that would be valuable for something like a Unicorn. It's valuable for a lot of things. And that's basically what I think Chuck is is headed towards. I mean, whether it whether it be a kernel or any other payload, the technology is exactly the same. We just need to know how to directly link and load an arbitrary executable, and we probably need a few tweaks to tell Beehive whether to start in 16-bit or a 32-bit mode, start in real mode or long mode. Is there uh, already a way to put all of that into an ELF file so that Beehive could understand this uh, ELF image or does it have to be PE or? It, well, what you want to do is use the, the the fact that generally starting Beehive is a two-phase process and that you create a memory region and then you point Beehive at it. So it would, the process that creates that memory map could read PE or L for whatever you wanted it to. But there's there's no clear documentation on how to do that. I know Peter at one time had some of the standalone NetBSD executables that they wrote for testing their hypervisor working in Beehive. What happened to that work? I don't know. Do you have a link to that work? That I came up recently. It. Yeah, it was on some mailing list somewhere and good luck finding that. I think, uh, I thought uh, it looked like his, his, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, grub to beehive work had some hooks for NetBSD in there. So I wonder if that was part of it. No, I think those were specifically for, for loading NetBSD kernels. There, there, but, but what I'm saying is that grub to beehive had code in there that was specifically for NetBSD. Well, upstream Grub can boot all kinds of things, including old K-free BSD Debian back in the day, and you name it. Just saying. I wish I could write. Uh,
So, Jan, tell us about this QAMU Arch64 bare metal boot. What the what? It's, this is just basically the smallest code you can run uh, on QEMU. So, and I was just looking into it because I wanted to find out what you have to put in a linker script there to encode the entry point, maybe the initial stack point or this kind of stuff, and what about it as platform specific. So how does ARM differ from AMD64, from legacy 32-bit platforms, and so on? Hmm. Because the uh, ability to just run an ELF and, yeah, that would be quite nice. Chris, but... circling back, if you've got audio work and anything more on the handbook or your VM state D, Let's see, you're muted, but... Yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, on... So, um, well, one question, one general question I have for everyone on the call is basically, what kind of additions or modifications do you feel are needed or missing, particularly with focus on the handbook and Beehive? Proper bridge network setup. Explanation on what to watch out for. So oh. you have to go into link scoping for IPv6 to explain yeah. that it is a dangerous misconfiguration to put an IPv6 address and to be honest, also an IPv4 address on any of the member interfaces. You're supposed to put them all on the bridge and how to make sure you don't lock yourself out of headless systems when converting the configuration. So that you're able to just add new tab members to the bridge without losing uh, network access during the reconfiguration. Is your blog post uh, handy relating to that? Yes, but it could, could of course, use that someone else uh, looking over it. Mm -hmm. I was also wondering, um, Jan, if I could convince you to create a port for your scripts like MKE pair, because I think that would, I mean, these kind of, you know, tools, it would be really nice to add that as well. Yes, I wanted to rewrite them in, uh, in C, but I haven't gotten around to doing it. I understand that, yeah. Thank you for that link on proper bridge configuration. Uh, Chris, he has it in the chat and I'll drop it in the doc. And I'm next. open to corrections if I overlooked anything. This is only what I learned over the years. Not, I'm not saying that I know everything. And I found the make e pair. I can be into it. Boom. No, bless you with a hyphen. What about um the different kind of storage backends? Because uh, I remember there's like uh, ways to use NFS and iSCSI. Um, Is that something to put in the handbook, or rather keep that? I don't know, in the man page. Well, because I was also thinking about you redoing the man page because that's also, to be honest, it, it looks like a mess. The, let me drop something uh, in here as well, um, which I, I just have to find the link. No one will stop you from updating the manual page and making it more clear, <laughs> just in case you're in depth there. This is uh, the problem we have to look into. 
um, the image I linked to is basically the type of documentation we need. Oh yeah, that was uh, kind of cool. Good point. Um, the, I will bring that axes, up. Uh, and then the four corners along those two dimensions uh, where main pages are normally always in the reference oh. uh, corner. And the handbook should be mostly in the upper half of that screen. Makes sense, yeah. But there is a difference between basically um, telling someone how to hold it, how to think about someone in a tutorial, the first is just getting them up and running. The thing is, you know, is it is it worthwhile to put a hint in there that you know points you in that direction that it can do that as well, for example? Um, sure. The problem is, but see, we have vidIO block, we have uh, SATA emulation, we have um, NVMe. The uh -huh. main difference between them is operating system compatibility and performance. But other than that, we all handle the same. Right. So you provide the configuration via, via the BIF command line or config file and it's static at runtime, mm -hmm. except for the last one, which is VidIO SCSI, where you can hot plug devices mm -hmm. at runtime uh, and hot unplug, uh, but that one, I don't see how you could make it approachable without writing tooling around it because the come target layer uh, command line interface is just, it's yeah, there, page, but it's also, quite uh, uh, unfriendly to use. Uh, yeah, it's just what it is. But it uses CTL. I mean, uh, you lib UCL, so you simply have a nicely formatted UCL config format. And never no, worry again. no. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can hope. CTLD um, is something different than the CTL admin command. I see. Uh, Chris, do you have a lab at your disposal for, say, if you were to smoke test performance on Vert IO versus emulated AHCI versus NVMe? I um I can definitely run some stuff. So um I'm not sure whether my storage is I don't know representative. Let's say or two thirty eight. It's um I mean I've got a server with with twelve twelve um uh, what's it called um twelve Rust disks basically. Um but... so it's a nice spread, but it's it's you know. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be comparable to NVMe and stuff like that. If you I want to uh, just measure the emulation overhead or virtualization overhead, you can uh, use a memory in-memory MD device. Just take a few gigs of RAM and use it as backend for your storage. I second that notion. Uh, but the other idea, thing yeah. is that it's highly uh, guest kernel dependent. So Windows may behave different than uh, Linux, and Linux may behave differently than FreeBSD or OpenBSD or other operating systems again. Correct. And I would do like all emulation types at once, simply have a, a gig or larger image for each, and then just step through them. You have don't um, care, guess don't care. Sequential reads just with... Um, yeah, just doing a DD won't uh, get you realistic performance characteristics. You probably would have to find a profile you want to measure in something like Fire. Yep. And then the, this like is that. my workload. I, if you want to do it in a methodical manner, or you could just run anything disk I/O limited and check the runtime and say that's good enough or that's close enough to a workload I consider relevant. Cool. And it's a really uh, thankless task. And 
naturally any wisdom collected a decade ago might be out of date, believe it or not. So it's, it's great that you're doing this and looking into it. Didn't oh. Clara did an article on that in their blog two years ago or so? Or one year ago? On the storage performance? Or one? Yes, different, different Beehive backends. Could be, yeah. Yep. Chris, anything on VM State D? Anything on VM State D? Well, um, I am. Um, I keep chugging away at the functionality for um, getting a bit more configuration capabilities into the UCL configuration file. I've got also added the um, suggestions uh, that you made previously about uh, adding some example files. That's all on the GitHub repo already. Unfortunately, it has not made it into the ports yet because that is up on 0.04, I think, and I'm already on 0.07, which is also already as a review of auxiliary. But unfortunately, um, I have a schema. Yes, I do not. And I have a schema, but unfortunately, it's, my, it's, my, it's in my head. Yeah, it's in my GitLab. Uh, yeah. um, uh, your audio is going point pretty point. bad, I'm sorry uh, to say. Uh, sorry, man. I didn't want to break it to you. Hey, Chris, do you have this audio problem in general, or is it just in this call, or is it just in Zoom, or? I think he, I think he logged out and is coming back. Uh, yeah, oh, he might it. be back. There, there he is. is. Go ahead and ask that again. Hey, Chris, do you only have this audio problem in this call, or is it Zoom in general, or is it in all conferencing software? Uh, Chris, we can't hear you right now. He's muted. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah, there you go. Well, so I only have this problem on Zoom, actually. And um, I'm I'm considering trying my uh, my phone line and my phone connection uh, on, on, on the next call. You know, Let's see whether that works better than this one. I don't know why this is happening or keeps happening. It's kind of weird. API right. documentation, look at that. Yeah, and uh, libucl can accept basically when parsing, not just the content to be parsed, but also a schema to validate against. All right, okay. So that's what I mean. All right, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so basically it takes something, because the data model is basically the same, you can think of it as almost like a JSON schema, which yes, bring up your XML uh, flavors if you want, because everything old is new again. You've been busy. Oh, that's that's the upstream. Okay, well, cool. It's That's the upstream uh, yep. for libucl. And So once you've passed uh, something into a valid document object model, basically you can validate that against the schema, which is just another uh, document. So, right. And um, one more point that I should also probably point out: um, the um, the bug you filed, uh, Jan, or the uh, libucl that I'm using, the private one. You're making a very good point. Um, I haven't changed that yet because I um, I was actually planning to add a uh, a user option into the port, so you can actually choose whether you want to run it with uh, with the mm -hmm. with the private one or with the one from ports. Yep. So while it's still this early that you can easily change things for the two or three users which may exist. Um, yeah, good point. The UCL can also uh, make use of a very flexible dot include macro. 
so that you can have a single configuration file, then include the other ones for potentially multiple directories to assemble that. So you don't have to have a fixed file system layout and pass multiple configurations. You can pass a single one. And then does that is that is that not working with the with the one built into base or is that a, an old version? It's, All right, no, okay. it's built in. All right, yes, okay. I need to try just, that out because okay, so that would should work out of the include. box basically. Okay, yeah. Uh, right, the only it. problem which uh, I found with the one in base, I don't know if it has even been fixed upstream, is there is a tempting feature uh, where it basically derives the base name for, uh, of an included configuration from the file name and then uses that as key for the object to be included so that it could take basically the... Um, for example, the get virtual machine name by stripping the .conf or .ucl suffix in the file name, and then using that as the key in a object. The downside is that for some stupid reason, there's a bug in the code and it only strips uh, the suffix from the first um, file. Yeah, that it because it doesn't reset the flag. I Found the bug, and I think I filed, filed a bug report somewhere, but I couldn't find it uh, yesterday. <laughs> well, keep up the good work. And Daniel, uh, I recall you aiming for about now for a Zelta release. Do you need any brainstorming on the syntax from people like users like Rod, perhaps myself? Um, let's see. So I think, I think I have some things to propose for the last three days before, before I release, I'm trying to make everything more consistent. So, you know, so the, so the items in the policy, the, 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 the policy configuration should also have corresponding double dash options and, and things like that. So, so I am trying to do some do some cleanup and consistency. I'm trying to get the the flags to match CFS send and receive flags and be really explicit about that and try to remove any options that aren't part of CFS send and receive. So, you know, so so uh, then, then it can be intuitive and work as a teaching tool also. Um, you know, and I'm adding I'm adding hooks and stuff like that. I think what I might do is is start steering towards double dash options, at least for a brief time until we can decide what the you know what the single letter option would be, just so I don't step on step on myself, you know, with with I, all that. I don't, I don't see any reason to even implement single letter options. Oh really? You don't so no. so the only single letter options I should be using are the ones that match ZFS send and receive. You think that would yeah, be that's, a, I think a that's wiser probably, choice? Yeah, I think so. I mean okay. any, any any more, it's it, I I think I find it more intuitive if we reserve single letter options to be things that are very global like little R for recursive or big R for replicate. Um, right. And dash for, dash for, N for, 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 for dry for run. Rows. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. H capital. And, yeah. So for for Zelta for the matching for the matching tool, I do capital, you know, mine uh capital H for no header, uh P for parsable because those are ZFS list options. So I, I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna follow that rule that single letter options will only mimic those. And then I'm 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 trying to get the policy system to basically be so you know Are you trying you to know, make it so you don't have to write a policy file? Well no I'm trying to make it so that the policy file will work with other replication tools or without Zelta replicate entirely. So you would be able to write your ZFS commands around it. So in other words, basically just Unix-like, right? A modular 
each modular piece can do things. So, so pre hooks, post hooks, send side, receive side, that'll give you your wake on land option that you're, you're looking for. And then the endpoint structure is basically the same as SCP, except if you add an at, and it'll, it'll take some action based on the snapshot as well. So it'll just be, it'll just be tools for endpoint management and then building blocks for, you know, list comparisons and, and replication. Um, that way, I think that we've got sort of maximum usefulness over the simplest possible scripts. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going for. I want this to be a tool that somebody can use for training wheels and then never use again. That would be, that would be fine with me. Um, you know, and, and make sure that we take advantage of other Unix tools that are already out there. Um, so, okay. But thank you about the, the double dash options. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. That, that makes sense. And then the options yeah. that we use are entirely, you know, are entirely going to be equivalent to ZFS commands or, or double dash only. Jan One of the problems with get opt uh, long is that it has slight syntactic differences between operating systems. For example, if an equal is required between the option and the value. I, I don't think get opt applies here because he's written this in awk and so it's his own parser. He's not calling get opt. Yeah, I don't have to I don't have oh, to worry about okay. any of that. So I'll just yeah, I'll just I'll just make the yeah, I'll just make it, and I, I rewrote the parser so it's it's less, you know, it, it parses correctly, basically. I just, that's a bug fix. So, yeah, um, yeah the other so I think, thing is... I think that's an imparity between the policy file options and the dash dash options, because right now I've sort of, I've done too much of developing three different tools and I need to make it, you know, a suite of, related tools that could plug in to, to other things. Also, I'm gonna take some functionality out of the match script because ZFS list already does it perfectly. Nice. <laughs> so I'm gonna, yeah, so I'm actually, I'm actually paring this down and following my own advice and making it more Unix-like as it, as it goes. Um, no, Z pull is not, has never been pull. Well, no. <laughs> it's just Z... called that. Well, it's Zpol, so it, but it pushes. So, have you renamed that, or it's well, I'm my the official documentation is uses the same phrasing as, um, as as ZFS does. So it's so it's Zelta match, Zelta backup, Zelta uh, uh, policy. Got it. So they're 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 short ones: Z match, Z pull, ZP. Um, but but the official doc is just Zelta this, Zelta that. And if you type Zelta by itself, it will spit out a nice usage document to tell you all about uh, nice. what its what its different features are. And Jan had a question about so failing that recursive replication when you have a chance. Yeah. So so if you want to use so if you use capital I, um, that will perform uh, a, a very careful then by the way uh, syncoid does this as well but it will it will walk through the data set tree replicate the first data set if necessary and then do a, the following incremental oh wow if you use capital so it's it's better than capital R but capital R does clones so you do want it sometimes and the way to do that would be just you know, Zelta, like, why does it keep capitalizing? Zelta backup dash R. What I meant is, D1. Um, let's say I have, have, I don't know if it's possible to hook there, but let's say there's a hook for each received data set, and, but it's a recursive replication and one of the hooks fails. Will you undo the already replicated data and go back to the old state if possible? Will you abort in whatever state? Will it be normally possible to fix this, let's say a typo in the script 
or uh, then resume, or do you expect users to have to clean this up manually? This is what so, I was hinting at. Yeah, so I, I I understand that all the all the replication tools out there will do cleanups with um, you know with with rollbacks and stuff. I'm I want to distinguish uh, distinguish the project by you know by by avoiding by avoiding that sort of thing. But I do think that it makes sense for me to build you know some extra extra scaffolding to make it easy to figure that out. Like like there's a Zelta clone that creates a tree of mounted data sets that are then safe to work in and destroy. Um, and you know, and I also am gonna I'm working on some tools to deal with uh, um, property property copying and stuff like that because it gets really hairy because you need, if you're using encrypted sets, you need dash W, but if you're using an older v, uh, version of ZFS, then dash W will not, it won't run at all. It'll fail. So there's a lot of look before you leap that's that's required in all this. And I think that some tools to help, um, you know, reconcile replication mistakes is is definitely needed in the world and definitely something that's that's agnostic to which replication tool you're using help you dig yourself out of uh things like that so 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 i'm working on i'm working on some stuff like that that i done that you know checks out mount points and uh and property problems and and replication overlaps uh and mismatches and, and stuff like that um but i think I'm, I'm definitely on track for the 19th when i will consider it released and then the next version will be I mean, frankly, a lot of the stuff that Jan's mentioned about dealing with bookmarks, dealing with um, with replication conflicts, uh, you know, with um, yeah, uh, Rod, you mentioned so, you mentioned something about the, uh, the the mount point path. Like, if 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 it might be a good idea to relativize a mount point path that you've replicated, so it's underneath the top of the data set. But then it still mounts it relative to the the path. So your Z root would be at the top. You know what I mean? Well, um, don't we still blow the mount point away on receive? So that information, yeah, that 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 information's lost. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to do is have a have a safe mount option where you can specify a source, and then and then mount the mount the uh, Target data sets relative to the to the source. Um, well, that's that's what happens if you delete the mount point. They, it inherits the mount point from the hierarchy of the destinations. Right, except that if it's a Z root, then you have the you know the root slash default, which is a few layers deeper. So it doesn't it doesn't map the it doesn't map the tree the same way that it would on the source. It's not that big of a deal. I don't think most people would necessarily need it. I just thought it would be a a nifty, I, you know. Yeah, it I, would. I think it would make it would make certain things. I thought it might make certain things more intuitive for the for the user. I don't know. It will make people using non deep boot environments that are using what I will call the legacy style boot environment, where where user and var were top level. Um, file systems or data sets, um, it will make their life easier. For those of us that have converted to a deep boot environment, we've already moved all of that stuff underneath. Um, so it's a non-issue for me, but just blowing them out point of ways, it, it works absolutely fine for all of my systems that are using um, deep boot environments, but I do for the boot environments where they're not that, and I have a few of them around that way and stuff. Yeah, preserving the ability to mount that stuff in the in the right hierarchy could be advantageous. Yeah, um, it's not a big deal for a for an option to add, and I definitely want a safe a safe mount option. So like a Zelta safe mount that make sure it's read only. Make sure it's you know it's it's not it's not written and then and then mount the tree, yeah. such that uh, you know so so that you can get to the working the working backup without modifying it and you can still accept 
replications on top. Um, that would be, I think that would be really useful. Um, I do, I haven't tried this, but I do have a question. What happens if I, in the, the replicated, in the backup set, I know you've got a bunch of checks to make sure that if the, the backup is modified in some way, you, you gripe about it and say that, Hey, the destination has been modified. I can't do this. Does a snapshot if I snapshot in the backup, does that screw with that mechanism? Yeah, I mean it's not going to roll it back. So if you make it, nope. so it will, it'll, it'll report very specifically what to do about it. It'll say you no, can. No, I'm talking about like that... I've I've got all of these backups replications that that I've done with with Zelta policy, and now I want to go add a snapshot tag into those. I'm not going to modify the data sets. All I'm going to do is add a snapshot to them so that I can do a, clone, a specific clone operation of a very specific set of snapshots. Is that going to mess with the way Zelta operates? I, I didn't need to see the, the commands because maybe there's a, a feature that I'm not aware of. Uh because if you if you take a if you take a snapshot and the latest GUID changes, right? So then then ZFS receive isn't going to be able to receive on top of that without clobbering the that's, that's the, what I thought. Um, that's what I thought. Yeah. So I think I think the the way around it though, because it is GUID aware, you could simply rename that the final snapshot, and if it's the same GUID, well, it's not Delta it's, doesn't. It's, it's uh -huh. not the final snapshot is what I'm doing is it's in the scenario where I, I've got all these backups and they have a bunch of snapshots in them. But I now need to go pull a clone of a specific combination of those snapshots. And it may not it's not the latest snapshot. It's an earlier snapshot and it may not be. A consistent snapshot across all of them. So, I see. so okay. you mean that's if you want to tricky, but do a point in time recovery of a jail or something? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I kind of need, children... need to go in and do a point of time recovery of a set of data but, sets. It, so if you specify if you specify a data set with Zelta clone in the I don't know if it's the dev version or if it's one of the feature branches, but there is, but if you add the at it will it will clone that tree from that from that the, point. The problem is, is that's, um, that's assuming that I'm. It's the same snapshot all the way down through the tree and in the all throughout the tree. Yeah, about, yeah. It's not the same snapshot all the way down through the tree. Yeah. So if it's latest, then it'll work. And if it's yeah. not latest, then I would have to dig back through creation time to find the earliest, which is absolutely a hundred percent possible. Um, we I could, mean, I can that, work. That, with it's possible to work around it another way by by doing piecemeal clones of right of the snapshots instead of instead of going in and adding my own snapshot i just have to piecemeal clone each data set actually you know what that sounds okay now that we're talking through this that sounds like an extremely dope option because if we could specify a date the, the latest date to to produce a clone tree from that would be yeah, something yeah. I'd want upstream, right? Yeah, that's yeah, that that's be, basically what I'm after. And and that would be that would be something we could push for upstream because ZFS clone works only on a local uh, a local pool. So that's actually an example of of something that I could add to Zelta to to you know make a make a bug request in the or an issue in um in the actual zfs clone utility and and add that because that would be why the hell isn't there a clone dash r there isn't right no there's not i'm looking right at it no yeah, there's okay. not you um, have to set up your own little x ox pipe line yeah yeah um, I, I think that it, would be it becomes that, and that would be harder because then you're Oftentimes, when you clone, you also want to set properties and so on. 
Yeah. Well, you can't automatically preserve properties. Yeah, but for example, if I want to set the clone to be read only immediately or change the delegation on it or stuff like this. A uh, quick question, Daniel. Did you say clones aren't replicated by default? Oh, no. no. So you can't do so, it. So I'm I'm actually in a I'm actually in an argument with Alan right now. Not an argument. I've asked him to explain because in if you look at the man page for ZFS send, dash uh dash I says that it'll work with a clone. So I should be able to reproduce clones in a tree, but it is it is not working hmm. um, because there's an origin, and you're supposed to be able to specify the dash i origin and then add, you know, add to an existing clone, add the add the snapshots to to an existing clone. So that's what that's the benefit of using zfs send dash r, is that it will keep clones in sync um, across the, you know, across the replication set. So that's my capital R D one. If you do, if you do that, then it'll check only the top data set, use capital R and then replicate it with clones and everything else through the entire, through the entire tree, which is, which is great if it worked, but it doesn't work sometimes as, as Michael, you, you, yeah, D is depth one. So you don't obviously don't need that in with ZFS send because ZFS send only, you know, only targets one, uh, one level. Uh, but uh, yeah, but you, Michael, you sent me that that bug report that ZFS send dash R doesn't even work with clones properly all the time. So I think there's there might be some bugs in there to find upstream if we do some uh, digging. But I, I love the idea of replicate the latest, the latest um, from or before a certain date um, for clone. That would be glorious. I think that's hmm. a, that's so an awesome, awesome you, idea. Could, exactly, you could look at the creation property of the snapshots. Exactly, that's exactly and what then I'm thinking. Say, of. Uh, greater equal. Exactly, that's it. And then the latest match. That's it. It's perfect. It's perfect. Um, you probably um, want to set so up. You need an everything interval. before, everything before ransomware hit, latest from that point or before, and you're good to go. Exactly. You're made in the exactly. shade. And um, why, why, why is the ZFS world having to hunt for these snapshots in, the, in an emergency? We shouldn't have to do that. Daniel, I think you want. Uh, it would be good if you could specify an interval instead. So. If it whether you restrict the window in either end. The other hmm, good idea. The, the other one that would be a, a feature request is why can't we? I mean, finding the generation number is hard, but why can't we arbitrarily add a snapshot at any generation of a data set? Almost like a retroactive bookmark, perhaps. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you can only I've long that if that. the data That's... is still completely available. So to do it retroactively, you would kind of have to do the mark phase of a garbage collector and find out if anything has been deleted, right? Well, I don't know that if I care yeah. about that. Do I care about? Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Okay. Because otherwise, yeah, it's because the, the snapshot. The, yeah, the snapshot keeps the data around if it's deleted in a future version, it's still attached to the snapshot generation. Exactly. Never mind. Never mind. Take care, Andrew. Don't miss him. So you can't really go back and expect everything to still be uh, live data. Well, now, wait a minute. If I have a snapshot older than the point I that is an older generation than the generation I want to have, that data still exists in the prior snapshot. Yes, but all changes between snapshots 
you could have basically write some data, release basically overwrite the data thereby implicitly destroying it or making it available for relocation. So the data is live, not live, and then something else is live again. Uh, but some uh, Uber block from in between the two snapshots, if you pick it up later and then hunt down the ZFS data structures, you could have basically a dangling reference to something which is no longer alive. So. Uh, Daniel, not to complicate it, but are you doing anything or imagining anything with say ZFS diff and mounted snapshot directories and other ransomware recovery strategies? Just this week, I had a situation um, of like, oh, this Excel file vanished. No one knows how or why, but let's go find it in previous versions. And what is the last snapshot that happens to have it? So some tool to traverse that would be hmm, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I made it. I made it. I have a one liner, but I do it uh, find an Ektarx actually. Okay. There you go. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but but there's actually uh, there's um um. Uh, uh, the Jim Salter's Findoid Perl script is really good. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's really good. Um, for for finding I've when when something when something's changed, and there there so so ZFS diff. And by the way, I'm not. I didn't research this and figure it out myself. I just asked Alan about it last week. Sure. But ZFS ZFS diff will help you find. Um collections faster basically of you know but if you're looking for a specific a specific file then looking in the dot zfs slash snapshot directory is probably going to be faster if you know precisely what you're looking for if you're looking for a bunch of things that change zfs diff is is what you're going to want hmm. okay so um what you can do is use ls-c uh, to sort all the fine things you find uh by modification times. Yeah. Uh, but the yeah, the only similar... the only down the only place that the only reason why I use find in my in my one liner is if the, it's too big, then it'll yes. it'll explode. But yeah, exactly, exactly. You That's can use do. you can pipe the output from find to x arcs to ls unless you unless uh, your list is too large, um, then you kind of have to throw it through stop and then through sort and <laughs> you, you're describing all my suffering Jan. <laughs> yeah so could we aim to locate but, database at the snapshot oh, directory for oh boy. this kind of <laughs> oh, no, i like it michael i like it i know right <laughs> but what that year is, is it man is it is it the future or is it 1997 that, that, Add timestamps to lo the locate DB code so that it could have. Um, oh, interesting. <laughs> may ahead. I recommend no. to instead just use uh, SQLite? We already have it. Uh, yeah. It's there. It is a lot more flexible to index into and query. And what I would like to see is print the snapshots, which contain basically. The first snapshot where an end time of a path appears. So basically every time a snapshot records a change to the file, uh, list only those snapshots, but uh, don't print snapshots where a file or uh, something didn't change. So basically to give help you uh, find which snapshots are worth looking at. Uh, if your ZFS metadata is still trustworthy because you are looking at the backup of a compromised system and not you're working on hmm. a compromised system's pool directly. Because if you have frequent snapshots, it can easily be, um, basically you get drowned out in duplicate the files. Hmm. And just this week, I was chasing down an important spreadsheet, and it was like, okay, we have this history. It was obviously modified at this last point and then not modified, and I'm pretty confident that's the last viable one we have, and anything to help that is appreciated. 
So that 19th, should we bump that up a month or two for all the nifty features we've thrown at you? <laughs> no, you're not You're not getting any of those features, but if they accept my talk at uh, BSD can, then I'll be talk. I, I can, I can, uh, I'll show them all off. I'm not on the program committee, um, just the organizing team. <laughs> I can't be bought. Sorry. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, motivated, maybe. Uh, Jan, did your oh, question no, get answered? I thought you about... were fundraising, Michael, so you're exactly to be bought. <laughs> oh, well, there was that, but that's for like a great party and a great this and that and tote bag and you name it. So there's that. Uh, Jan, did your question get answered, which was create a clone of the backup destination, blah, blah, blah? Um, not explicitly, but from what uh, I understood, Daniel, its intent is it would only be a problem during pruning uh, of the backup destination because then the uh, clone's origin uh, can't be destroyed without dash uppercase R and force if it's still mounted. So, and he right. and uses this is, this is Zelta. Exactly. This is, this is Zelta. <laughs> it will just complain at you. <laughs> it, won't, it won't actually do anything dangerous. Um, though I'll, I'll add, I'll add buttons to press to help you do things dangerous if you want, but, uh, we, we gotta be careful about but, not saying it doesn't do anything dangerous because some of these states that you can get your backup set into will cause the Zelta policy or the Zelta backup to not do the backup. And that is a dangerous position. Right. That's true. That's true. So, yep. Yeah, that's that's right. If you use if you use Sanoid, then you're guaranteed that as long as as long as the GUID exists in the tree, it's going to run a backup. Um, which which I can't which I can't promise unless you start with Zelda. And I, I think that I think that making a tool to yeah, I think there basically just needs to be like a checkup source target tool to let you know what the differences are, like as like a Zelda match, except it tells you about properties, tells you about rights, and tells you when, you know, what might need to be rolled back. And and that, of course, could be piped, just like, you know, into, into uh, XARG, ZFS, destroy, or whatever, and then, then we'd be good to go, because I want, yeah. Uh, I haven't used Zelta in Anga before, so I don't know. Uh, do you have already... A mechanism in place to basically verify the liveness of a replication setup on both ends so that if either end is still up and running and the replications stop coming in you get alerted so what i do is i just um i i prefer to do the snapshot policies on the source and the um and on the and on the destination i i do i do a list of um creation dates of the of the received snapshots to make sure they're consistent with my expectations so there's a the little script of z port or or actually a zelta report um in there that sends me a slack alert i have not i've not curated that that's not ready for public consumption but i prefer a local check for that sort of thing, because I want the I want the check system to be pretty separate from the replication system, pretty separate from the uh, the the RPO RTO snapshot management system. That's what I'm. That's going to be what. Go ahead, Jan. What I meant is uh, a little a sub command for Zelta or some other tool you wrote. Uh, so that the backup source can make sure that uh, the backup target has is no uh, more than this many hours behind and the other way around. So that if, if backups go stale on either end, uh, the one which is still around and potentially, especially the source creating that are to um, be up. Yeah, like you I want to get alerting on that. Sorry, my head died. And that's um, something where oftentimes uh, existing tools just don't help you at all. Yeah, it's kind of I, health yeah, checking yeah. of your policy. Yeah, I guess. I guess I'm doing that currently on the 
backup side. And since the backups are receiving the source, then I don't actually have any double checking on the source because I'm going to get an alert that, you know, the last, the last replication I, I saw was two hours old. If that doesn't happen on the backup, I get an alert. So I don't need an additional alert from the source. Um, however, I definitely can see a need for, you know, checking that at, at any point. And certainly we could, uh, I mean, I mean, what, what is that beyond, beyond just sort of checking the create creation date? Um, yeah, checking the creation date is completely acceptable in my opinion. And the problem is that what I have had, uh, what I had happened to me was that basically the um, one uh, of my locations was basically a single home, and the ISP had a BGP. Um, misconfiguration and so like 90 percent of the routes were missing one of the systems was isolated couldn't reach the other one couldn't reach most of the internet but could still do local stuff and be reached by some of the network and so it's not black and white. It can be that both systems are running, but they can't talk to each other. And one of them, at least, uh, can't reach the external monitoring and can't trigger an alert anymore. And then it would be just nice that the other system, as part of a backup policy, would say, well, I'm supposed to receive a, a replica every hour, and I haven't... with." been able to pull something for like six hours, maybe it's time to uh, annoy someone's pager. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I, look, I'm all about belt and suspenders, believe me. I think I think you're right. That makes yeah. sense. Though, though, would it need to be any different on the source as the target? Or it's basically the, the same? The question is depending on how you do, do the replication, push versus pull it, maybe at, is the for... In a pull configuration, uh, how does the source know what's the last one which has been successfully received in the face of network interruptions? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of the, the puller link side has to tell the source then what is its latest state or has to have some kind of health check functionality where it, or put uh, the last confirmed creation time or snapshot or something with a marker how far it got and store that in the source so that the source can look it up. Right. And then Oh, it's not perfect because that suddenly means that, yeah, the pulling backup system modifies the source in a minute little way. So it's no longer read only hmm. to pull if you record success or failure or whatever. But in a pure pull configuration, I don't see another way to do it. All right. So and you it's say not we need that a Delta I want call. you to mm. bring in uh, things like uh, direct monitoring, but just a command which some monitoring tool could invoke so that it doesn't have to do all the ZFS uh, integration and date math itself. All right, that's uh, that's all. That's all really good stuff. Great work, Daniel. I hope you had a great trip. Yeah, it was it was wonderful. Uh, so what, what I want to talk at some point, I guess, at this next ZFS call. But what are, what are this stuff that we're talking about? Can we get upstream?
because that's I think that's really my biggest goal with with uh, with Zelda is what can we standardize and just give to everybody, you know, versus, you know, I mean, we need some scaffolding because there's always going to be bugs and we'll always need scaffolding for it. But, you know, something to compare, something to compare uh, snapshot lists, something to compare clones and something to replicate clone, like all that, all that stuff needs to exist now. But, you know, the 2028 version of ZFS shouldn't need it. <laughs> yeah, better example scripts even uh, around ZFS diff and recursive uh, diffs and so on. So that yeah. you can basically treat uh, sub data sets as part of a parent data set uh, for diffing purposes. And then this could be really useful for someone trying uh, to get back up and running after any kind of compromise to find out what could have changed, where is the sudden spike of changes to just pin something down at a point where you don't want to um, or unable to take the time to write the proper cleanup code and so that you're not forced to come up with nifty one-liners uh, in the trenches. Of course, document what you find because you are exercising things that are so often on autopilot that uh, no attention gets given to them. So you're you're doing Rod's work. I mean, dog's work. I mean, God's work. Somebody's <laughs> work. Um, I saw a script just this week related to diffs. And I'm trying to find that where yet another person tried to make it easier. But yeah. Um, Did you see so, uh, Hot Top Time Machine? Oh, right. Uh, share that with the group, will you? Yeah, it's I, I don't know if it's it's been worked on, but Hot, um, what hot tub time machine script or what? What's the name? HTT HTTM. Um, yeah, this is it. Oh, he's still working on it. Okay. Or he or she, I don't know, but uh, uh, yeah, this guy. It's okay. it's a it's like a midnight commander type, like uh, like. You know, lets you dig into data sets, sort of like Apple Time Machine. Um, there there might be some goodies in there. I I find it it's it's got like a lot of switches, and then it's got sort of a UI. So I found it. I mean, the, the this this might all be fixed by now. It's been a while since I tried it, but I found it a little bit tough to use. But it had a lot of interesting ideas on making it. You know or at least trying to make it very user-friendly to do CFS recovery. About so. doing CFS recovery, especially for things like when you uh, fuck up your configuration royally, uh, maybe it would be a good idea to just pull, basically pull so, uh, some subset of the files into a Git repository and then basically have one fake commit for uh, each snapshot so that you could use the existing tooling for dealing with uh, merge conflicts and code reviews to look at your unintentional code changes. On that note, anything else? Yeah, and I'll drop that script in if I can find it, but I think someone was crawling the mounted snap deers. Anyway. So. Yes, sir. Chris, if you want, uh, I can give you an example of how I use uh, UCL uh, with includes uh, to get by with a single configuration file 
instead of uh, one per whatever and have it all be part of a single uh, tree of uh, UCL objects. Okay. Do you have that on GitHub or? No, um, it's too little to even put it on GitHub and it's all, all right. uh, configuration, so no. <laughs> <laughs> I understand have, that, yeah. <laughs> it's not pu public, so uh, let's yeah, do yeah, that got it. after we're recording, and it's just like three lines or so, which yep, you have makes to sense. Make. My grandma used to say, like and subscribe. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Michael. See ya. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Bye.